Yeah, so um, thanks for the introduction. Um, and I've actually been here for a few days now. And I've had the opportunity to meet quite a few of the students, and it's been fun. We've we even made our own little resonator, and we're testing some of the readout electronics right here. I also got a, a nice tour of the observatory on campus and saw some of the history there. Um, and I hope to actually see that later today as well. Um, I also just got a really cool tour of, uh, of the universe, and I made it back on time for the, for the talk uh, in the visualization lab, so thanks for that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about mapping the millimeter and submillimeter way, uh, way of sky 10 times faster with prime cam. Okay, but first I'm going to start with just a picture from Google Earth. Um, so the telescope is going to be located in Chile. And just giving a little bit of perspective here, so there's a little, uh, some of you may be able to see it, but there's a blue dot right where the telescope is going to be located. And if you zoom in, here is the zoom in the top top level view, you'll, you'll see that um, there's actually a, a large area that seems somewhat flat and then some rocky outcroppings. So uh, ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, is actually in this plateau region. And this is the Atacama Desert of Chile. This is one of the highest altitude, driest places that you can get other than the South Pole. Um, it's a bit easier to operate here than at the South Pole. Um, but South Pole is a, a slightly better site. Um, and then there's another experiment, Apex. Um, and then on this rocky uh, peak here called Cerro Chajnantor, that is where uh, the telescope I'm going to be talking about today is going to be located. And it's actually at 18,000 feet, um, so about 600 meters above the plateau. And, that, and why that is important? Well, um, so it's important because in the millimeter and submillimeter, the atmosphere um, has a lot of absorbing uh, molecules. And one of those that's really bad is, uh, is water vapor. So you want to be as high altitude as possible to be looking through the smallest amount of atmosphere possible so that most of this water vapor is, uh, you have the least chance. And so this is a plot of the transmission uh, versus frequency um, for the particular site at Cerro Chajnantor. Um, so these colored bars are actually the different bands that we plan to plan to implement on our telescope. But uh, the important thing to see here is that as you go from the left to the right in increasing frequency, um, the different amount of precipitable water vapor, which is the PWV value here, so this is how much water is, is actually in that atmosphere uh, that you're trying to look through in order to get to see some distant objects. Um, the different amounts um, will actually affect your transmission drastically as you go to higher frequencies. So this site is really important for instance for the 850 gigahertz band uh, where it's on average about half the precipital wa water vapor that you would get on the plateau. So there's good reason to go up that high but it's very challenging. So once you've maximized this you've You've built your telescope on, in the driest and highest place you can. Um, you are uh, making sure you're doing everything right there. Um, what you have to ask yourself, what is the actual ultimate sensitivity limit for a telescope? So once you're assured you have the best spot, can you actually show that you can get near this ultimate sensitivity limit? And what actually is that limit? Well, actually, the limit is from the light you're trying to observe itself. So the fluctuations, the power fluctuations on the incoming radiation field, when those are dominating your output signal, that's when you have achieved uh, background limited sensitivity. Um, and one, this plot that I've made here is I just wanted to show something interesting is that if you assume a, a thermal distribution for your, for your emitting source on the sky, you actually have two different um, scaling, scalings for this, this photon noise. And one is very common to radio astronomers, the Dickey radiometer equation on the top, so that your noise scales as the proportional to the power. And then for optical astronomers, it's, it's common to have this Poissonian shot noise term where it's root power. So we've actually had um, a lot of detector development that has gotten our detectors so sensitive that they are now limited by these photon fluctuations them themselves, not actually the detector noise. So we are about as sensitive as you can possibly be um, 
And so once you've done that, you've maximized your site, you've maximized how sensitive your detectors are to uh, these. So how do you actually make a telescope more sensitive? Um, well, uh, one way of, of thinking about that is thinking about how, how fast you can map the sky. And there are different terms that would go into this, and one of them is optical throughput. And so if you maximize that, so how much light am I actually getting to my uh, detectors? You can also increase the number of detectors, um, and then you also want to keep the efficiency high. Um, and so that is exactly what the Fred Young submillimeter telescope is supposed to do. So it's maximizing the optical throughput. Um, and this was a sort of an idea that has a, a long history, but the recent rendition of it is uh, sort of explained in, in this paper by Mike Nemack. So we're going to map, map the CMB 10 times faster with this. And why would we do that? Or how does that actually work? Well, um, the optical throughput is, is how we're doing that. So this is basically prime cam is, is going to capitalize on this um, by having a 2,000 centimeter squared uh, steradian uh, throughput. And this is just the product of the area and the acceptance solid angle. Um, and uh, apex, this is about um, 100 times uh, the optical throughput that ERAM and apex have and 10 times ACPOL. So really big improvement there. And so what kind of receiver would you actually develop if you're trying to capture all of this light? Well, one, uh, um, before you do that, uh, you want to have a commissioning instrument where you could test all these technologies. So what I'm showing first here is ModCam. This is at Cornell. And uh, the, main, uh, the main collaborators for developing the instrument are at Cornell, um, uh, a, German, a consortium of German universities and also Canadian universities. But this is in, the, in the, one of the labs at Cornell. This is going to be a commissioning instrument with just one uh, bands, the 280 gigahertz array. Um, this will allow us to actually work out a lot of the kinks with this new detector technology at such a high altitude site. Um, but the arrays are being tested right now at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, and they are developing um, all of their all of our arrays. Um, and we're going to plan to deploy this in 2024. Um, and then the prime cam instrument, so this will be the actual uh, science instrument. Uh, it will have uh, three, it, there are three, currently three imaging polarimeters in development, the 280, 350, and 850 gigahertz array. Um, and there will be two Fabry Perot based interferometers um, titled, uh, named EOR spec, and EOR spec because it's going to be probing the epoch of reionization. Um, and then there is also uh, plans to make a super spec like on-chip spectrometer for one of these tubes. But um, the idea is that you have a very modular design. Each one of these hexagonal uh, optics tubes, we call them, is, is essentially a different instrument, uh, maybe completed by one group. And there are actually a couple that are open to new collaborators. So if you have an idea about what kind of instrument you want, you can put it in one of these optics tubes. Uh, we actually have underutilized the telescope throughput with this design. We could actually make one that's even bigger. And so, okay, so once you've done that, um, what kind of detector technology do you want to choose? Well, when you're really scaling stuff, uh, multiplexing is extremely important. Uh, for years, the detector technology on the left-hand side of the screen is ha has been used for a millimeter and submillimeter detection. And this is a, an image of one of the spiderweb bolometers. It changes its resistance um, based, on, uh, it, based on temperature uh, temperature change. And then there's also a superconducting version uh, of a bolometer called the transition edge sensor. And those are the most popular detectors to use. Um, but around 2003, a new technology emerged on the scene, and it's called the microwave kinetic inductance detector. Um, developed uh, at JPL Caltech. And so for about 20 years, we've been trying to uh, use that and get it ready for um, a science instrument. So this is, let me explain a little bit about this technology, but this is uh, the technology that we'd like to use for all of 
feast and prime camp. So uh, lumped element kinetic inductance detectors, so they are uh, essentially represented by this uh, figure in the center, this uh, lumped element model, where you've got an inductor, which is actually photosensitive, a capacitor, and, uh, and the combination of those two, the inductor and capacitor, make a resonator. And there is another capacitor on there to couple to some, some feed line. But if you arrange it in this uh, shunted way, a, a shunt resonator way, then you can string a lot of these together in parallel, and you can tune each one to have a unique resonant frequency. And by spacing them out across the band, you can have, uh, you could fill your band and essentially you get natural frequency multiplexing. Um, and the interesting thing here is that the frequency shift due to the change in inductance um, is proportional to the absorbed power. So that's how you use it as a detector. So I can look at the um, change in transmission and complex transmission at some particular frequency and infer a frequency shift from, from that change in transmission. And that gives me uh, an absorbed power. So what do these actually look like? Well, um, on the top left, these are three arrays from a previous project that I worked on, BLAST TNG. Um, so that's about 3,000 detectors there. Um, read out with only 10 coaxial cables. If you had to read out a similar technology, you would require many more cables and wires and, uh, and other components. Um, so the, the MUX factor is, is great, although it does add complexity onto the warm readout. Um, so how do you couple light to this? So you see on the bottom, bottom left, that is actually an aluminum horn block. And each one of those holes is actually a, a conical feed horn that couples the light in a single mode, right down onto the center of the detector on the right. So this magenta square that is highlighting this, that is the exit hole for the, uh, for the bottoms of the horns. And the photons will be absorbed on those, on those sort of crosshairs. And those are the inductive elements. And those inductors will then change their value. Um, in, and that will shift the resonant frequency. Yeah, so one of the ideas was to not only have detectors in a crosshair XY, right, but also with you. So it rotated by about 45 degrees uh, for, the, for the next pixel over. This would be one pixel with two polarizations, and then the next one will be rotated. So, yeah. So it is? That is the plan? Or? That is the plan, yeah, okay. to have them scattered. But then we also have the way that they fit together uh, is going to be at 60 degree increments. Mm -hmm. so, in, in different arrays or subarrays? Uh, different arrays, different arrays. So you'll have, you'll have many more than actually just. And what about for blast? Was it, those, those are the blast arrays, right? Yeah, we also had them uh, yeah, separated, alternating. Uh, we were also flying a half wave plate though. Ah, okay. And so that allows us to remove some of the. Could yeah. you do something with circular polarization instead? Could you manage? Wouldn't that give you the ability to? I think you would need a quarter wave plate. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. If 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 one were crazy enough to do that, <laughs> okay. you could do a quarter wave plate. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So that was uh, an enabling tech for for prime cam, and the other enabling tech that we couldn't be doing this without is uh, cryogenic low noise amplifiers. So all of our detectors, are, they're super, made out of superconducting materials. Um, and uh, we have to bias them with very low powers. Otherwise, they will uh, lose their superconductivity if we bias them uh, with too much. Um, and because of that, we have to uh, take our signals, our really small signals, and amplify them uh, and get them out of the cryostat. And so we have to put our amplifiers inside of the cryostat as close as possible to the detector arrays. Um, so just leaning on what's been going on in radio astronomy for years is that they've been using these cryogenic amplifiers that have uh, an in input referred noise temperature, which is uh, lower than their physical temperature, which is quite impressive stuff. So on the right, 
and you'll see a plot here that's got noise temperature on the y-axis on the right, and these blue curves are showing this, this, uh, this value for different frequencies, and so it's about 2 Kelvin, um, and that, what is that supposed to mean? That means it's equivalent to having an ideal amplifier with a resistor at its input at a physical temperature of 2 Kelvin. So that is the amount of noise that will be added to your signal that you're trying to, to gain. And the detectors have around a 40 Kelvin uh, noise or more. So we have about a factor of 10 dB, and it could be better uh, above the noise, the intrinsic noise of the detectors. So I should mention that there have been previously deployed MKIT instruments, and we're building off of the hard work of a lot of different groups and collaborations with open source work. So Music and Mako were, I think, some of the earliest uh, renditions of, of MKID cameras. And then Archons and Darkness, those are uh, slightly different. They were actually looking for pulse detections, but using the same detector technology, but tuned for near-infrared. Um, and uh, Nika and Nika 2, so the Europeans have been, have been using these detectors for a while. And actually, there was an instrument on the ERAM 30-meter telescope that is, that it's still operational. Uh, Olympo was a balloon-borne project um, that, that launched just before last TNG did. Um, so they are the first kinetic inductance detectors in a, uh, on a high-altitude platform. And uh, how do I actually relate to this? So I worked on BLAST TNG, so that stands for Balloon-Borne Large Aperture Submillimeter Telescope. And this is the next generation. There have been previous deployments of the BLAST telescope uh, as far back as 2006. Um, but this is the next generation. So the idea with the next generation is not only a next generation of students, but um, also instruments uh, and detector technology. So they switched from bolometers to uh, kinetic inductance detectors. And uh, so me and uh, another graduate student uh, in the center there worked on the readout electronics platforms, and we took a nice picture after passing the thermal vacuum chamber tests on the left, um, and then what the BLAST TNG telescope actually looks like on the right in our um, in our deployment to Antarctica. Um, so we actually ended up flying this thing, and uh, and it was it was both a triumph and a tragedy. We were able to uh, get our telescope up to float altitude and do some sky dips map a source, uh, and then we suffered a, a mechanical failure. And we believe that this may have been caused by a piece of falling debris called the collar, which holds the helium in the top of the balloon on the left-hand side. You can see the balloon and the, the gondola at the very bottom there. But uh, a piece struck the, struck the gondola when we were launching. And uh, we think that over time, it uh, weakens the carbon fiber strut and caused a failure. So. We were supposed to do a map or a loop around Antarctica, like what you see this this blue circle, uh, but we ended up just doing this little red line here. But uh, overall, it was to show that these detectors could could be used. And um, the plot on the left here for some of the experts in the room, we had detectors that were dark and then ones that were optical, and we were looking at the difference between the noises in two different quadratures. And we think that this plot shows that this is. Uh, detector noise dominated performance, or photon noise with generation recombination noise dominated performance at float. Um, so uh, yeah, so it has a legacy. So that, that firmware, um, because it was developed open source, um, we were able to actually work with a lot of different groups and provide it to others. Um, so other projects like SuperSpec, Muscat, and Toltec. Uh, Toltec is a Interesting, uh, interesting instrument that's being commissioned right now on the large millimeter telescope on the right. That's a 50 meter dish. And then in the center, you see uh, one of the LMT research engineers with this large rack of readout electronics. So that was also running the BLAST TNG firmware. And, and then it's also been used um, with different collaborations for testing different arrays uh, for the terahertz intensity mapper and the exclaim instrument. So this was uh, after my last last year uh, in grad school, the Xilinx radio frequency system on a chip came out. And so this was actually one of the most 
uh, it, it was a huge advancement in terms of, uh, of integrated technology for FPGAs. So it took, basically I could have put all of what's on the left in that last TNG Roach 2 stack of five readout electronics boards for more than 250 watts, and I could have done all of that on the right here with one board for about 40 watts. Okay, so around the time I was graduating, there was an opportunity to actually move to Canada. So I went from the desert in Arizona, seeing saguaro cactus and prickly pear to uh, the rainforest in the Northwest. Um, and specifically, I'm working actually, uh, well, technically I went from one research basement to another research basement. And the other one is at this really cool lab called uh, National Research Council Canada, Herzberg Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Center. So they have a really helpful millimeter wave lab that helps work on the band three receivers and still actively maintain them. So they've got a lot of cool gold-plated microwave gear to, to play with. But they also uh, gave us some space in, in uh, the basement to actually set up a new dilution fridge. And that's what you see on the right. So uh, Scott Chapman is a professor that I'm working with who got the innovation, the CFI grant, um, to work on the 850 gigahertz camera and then also develop the readout electronics. So what, what are the readout electronics? So this is my job. So you see we're all kind of in lockdown. I had to sit in uh, front of a computer and design a lot of the DSP. So my plan was to develop on this generation one RFSOC board, uh, utilize onboard mixers, just use the heritage from Blast TNG and distribute the workload across all of these ARM cores that are on the chip. So why is the RFSOC so good? Well, they've integrated uh, high-speed digitizers with ARM cores and reprogrammable logic fabric. Um, so massive, usually those are on separate, separate chips and, they, and the signals have to travel along the PCB. You lose a lot of power that way. Um, so massive integration is, is where you can get a lot of gains. Um, so the idea is to use the RFSOCs really as the, the individual workhorses. Um, and really from a command terminal, we would just send simple commands and each RFSOC would, would pick those up and implement them to, for their particular detectors. Um, so what is actually the magic here? So uh, the gateway, so inside of the FPGA, we're putting a digital signal processing algorithm that allows us to read out these detectors. And how we do that is for each resonator, we have to send out a frequency comb that is matched to its original resonant frequency. And so we put that in a frequency comb lookup table. And right now we're using DDR4 RAM. So just like a RAM stick in your computer. And we're playing that at nearly the highest maximum transfer rate that you can actually go at. Um, and that's going out of the digital to analog converters and then goes through the detectors, comes back in. And then we have two stages of channelization which allow us to um, downsample and average the, each detector signal before we shoot them out as UDP packets to be collected later. So one of the really important things uh, that we've done with, with the RFSOC is that we've eliminated a lot of the microwave components that were in between the cryostat and the uh, FPGA itself. Because they have such high-speed digitizers, we can uh, directly sample or di directly generate signals at high enough RF frequencies um, so we don't need analog mixers. Um, we don't need a frequency synthesizer uh, either. So they were they were uh, their own limits within the BLAST TNG system. And so we've completely done away with that by just utilizing high-speed digitizers and then doing digital mixing um, and using up converters and down converting uh, filters. Okay, so, so this is the actual chip. Uh, and what I showed you previously was just a block diagram of the gateway of the algorithm. And if we look under the hood of what four of those actually look like, what we'd see is something like this. Uh, I've just colored the different channels that were implemented. So uh, each one of these channels would be controlling a set of 1,000 detectors. And so you've got four channels here, about 4,000 detectors. And then this blue area here is uh, 
called axi. So that is just control um, registers. But this whole, this whole area is just um, essentially a sandbox of digital logic that you implement your algorithm on. And if you can see in the top, you actually have a lot of space that is free. So potentially, you can implement more channels than just four. OK, so, um, so we tested this. So I, I built the four-channel design and tested it on the bench. I was generating 1,000 tones, which would be like reading out 1,000 detectors um, from all four channels. I scrounged around the lab and found a, a four-channel power combiner and put it together, put all signals together, and then tune their uh, center frequencies to be separated just so I could visually look at it on a spectrum analyzer. And I end up getting uh, nice waveforms. And also, the product here is important, just measuring the power here. So that's 36 watts running full bore with uh, 4,000 tones, so 9 milliwatts per tone. And just comparing this to a Roach 2 system or Blast TNG, the previous generation, that's 50 milliwatts per tone. So it's almost five times. You could fly five times the number of detectors for the same power. So it's a huge uh, boom for, for balloon-borne telescopes here. Um, but OK, so the firmware is great, but you have to actually control it. <laughs> uh, so there's a software architecture required. And the idea here is that because each RFSOC has an ARM core running Linux, we could um, implement our software on that, sort of distributing the load across each, uh, each RFSOC. Um, and the way that that is done is with, is with just a published subscribe model of Redis. And we would say, uh, from some command terminal over Ethernet, we would say, do some calibration, set up the detectors. And those would be picked up because of all of the RFSOCs have some Python file that is constantly listening and subscribing to that channel. And they will pick that up and then implement it. Um, and then all of the detectors are streaming, constantly streaming detector data over a separate Ethernet network. And then uh, those, will be, those packets will be captured, um, time tagged, or compressed, and then sent for some storage somewhere. So all of this code is actually on GitHub. Um, and I'm working with James Reboyne, who is a UBC grad student on this, and uh, hope to be working also with, with some people here on this. Um, yeah, and so now hardware. So I've gotten back to hardware again now that the, the labs are all open. Um, and this is our setup, actually, at NRC. So we've got a 512 pixel device um, mounted to the coldest plate of our dilution fridge. So these detectors have to be operated below a Kelvin. And we like to operate them around 150 could go up to 250 maybe, but uh, this cryoset is meant to get as low as about 8 millikelvin. Um, so in the very bottom here, this is the coldest plate um, and that copper box. And I hooked up uh, for, the, for the first time. It was essentially the first light for this, for this cryoset and the readout. Um, hooked up this four-channel design and read out the array. And you'll see on the laptop on the right, it is a a sweep of all of the resonators. And each one of those little lines is, uh, is a different detector. And we expect um, first light. So we're, we're racing towards this. Um, I think there's still work to be done on the software. And there's some serious challenges with um, determining how to actually use and calibrate this detector data at this scale. Um, so collaborations are definitely welcome there. Uh, and yeah, community, uh, community efforts are already underway with, with uh, Tim and JPL Caltech. Um, thanks, for, thanks for listening. <sighs> yeah, um, I, I, I would say it's, it's a little bit easier. Although they took out, what was it? It was FPGA editor, I think it was. They took that out where you could actually physically route these different ones by hand, these different paths between the switch. Yeah, but it is, it is, it is good. Um, I would say that ISC was worse. Sure. Yeah, um, well, OK. So 280 gigahertz. Um, CCAT, CCAT Prime, I guess, is really um, going to be an incredible addition to um, 
for observing the CMB, removing foregrounds for CMB studies. Uh, and then also, because we've got polarization sensitive detectors, um, looking at nearby objects, looking at um, uh, potentially the polarized light that will contribute, uh, that will be emitted from uh, dust grains that are aligned or uh, with magnetic fields. So understanding the magnetic field structure of star forming regions, that will also help us uh, do this. So the 280 gigahertz I think is going to be mainly that and um, we would like to have the prime cam instrument actually to do, to do the proper science, but I think it's just going to be a learning experience with with the 280 gigahertz mod cam. Okay. Any questions or on this? Okay. And if any students want to get bonus points, you can help throw away boxes. So that I don't know. Okay. Let's thank our speaker again.